Food, Shelter, and Clothing, excerpted from Time on the Cross, The Economics of American Negro Slavery, by Robert Fogel and Stanley Ingerman, published in 1974. The belief that the typical slave was poorly fed is without foundation in fact. This mistaken view may have arisen from a misinterpretation of the instructions of masters to their overseers, for these documents often mention only corn and pork in outlining the rations that were to be distributed to Negroes. The typical daily ration described was two pounds of corn and one half pound of pork per adult. The misinterpretation stems from the incorrect assumption that the lack of reference to other foods meant that the slave diet was restricted largely to corn and pork. Overseers' instructions, however, were not book-length manuals. They usually occupied just a few handwritten pages, generally ranging between 1,000 and 3,000 words in total, and were confined to outlining the major features of the routine the master wished to be pursued. They were not meant to be exhaustive documents, but to underscore those aspects of plantation management that particular owners held to be especially important. The incomplete nature of these widely quoted instructions is seen by the frequent omission of such important matters as rations for children, the disposition of wheat and other grain crops besides corn, the care of chickens and other small livestock, the production and disposition of dairy products, and the different feeds to be used for the various categories of livestock. The instructions to overseers are useful not because they contain a complete description of the plantation routine, but because they reveal which aspects of that routine were uppermost in the minds of the plantation owners. The rationing of corn and pork to slaves was emphasized by slaveholders for two reasons. First, while corn and pork did not constitute the totality of the slave diet, they were the core of the diet on most plantations. Unlike other foods, such as fruit and vegetables, which were fed to slaves only in certain seasons, daily, weekly, or monthly rations of corn and pork were distributed throughout the year. Secondly, while beef, chickens, dairy products, and Irish potatoes had to be consumed soon after they were slaughtered or harvested because they were difficult to preserve for later use, pork and corn were kept in store for the full year. Winter, especially January and February, was the season for killing, curing, and smoking pork, which could then be kept under lock and key in smokehouses until it was needed. Ensuring that the store of pork and corn was sufficient to last the entire year was one of the principal duties of the overseer, which is why explicit instructions on the disbursement of these two staples were common. The overseer, wrote one master, must himself keep the keys of the corn cribs, smokehouses, and all other buildings in which any property belonging to me is stored, and must himself see to the giving out of food. Feed everyone plentifully, wrote another, but waste nothing. More careful reading of plantation documents shows that the slave diet included many foods in addition to corn and pork. Among the other plantation products which slaves consumed were beef, mutton, chickens, milk, turnips, peas, squashes, sweet potatoes, apples, plums, oranges, pumpkins, and peaches. Certain foods not produced on most plantations were frequently purchased for slave consumption, including salt, sugar, and molasses. Less frequent, but not uncommon, purchases for slaves included fish, coffee, and whiskey. In addition to food distributed to them, slaves supplemented their diet in varying degrees through hunting and fishing, as well as with vegetables grown in the garden plots assigned to them. Unfortunately, surviving plantation records are not complete enough to permit determination of the average amount 
of each of the foods purchased for slaves, or the quantities of meats and fish that slaves obtained through hunting and fishing. However, on the basis of data obtained from the manuscript schedules of the 1860 census, it has been possible to compute the average amounts of 11 of the principal foods consumed by slaves who lived on the large plantations of the cotton belt. These 11 foods are beef, pork, mutton, milk, butter, sweet potatoes, white potatoes, peas, corn, wheat, and minor grains. While this list is short, it probably accounts for 80% of the caloric intake of slaves. Fish, fowl, game, sugar, as well as the various omitted vegetables and fruits, were choice items, but they did not constitute a large part of the diet for either whites or blacks during the middle of the 19th century. Figure 33 shows that the average daily diet of slaves was quite substantial. The energy value of their diet exceeded that of free men by 1879 by more than 10%. There was no deficiency in the amount of meat allotted to slaves. On average, they consumed six ounces of meat per day, just an ounce lower than the average quantity of meat consumed by the free population. While pork was more important in the slave than in the free diet, the difference was not as large as is usually presumed. Slaves averaged 70% of the free population's consumption of beef. The milk consumption was low by free standards, but still amounted to about one glass per day for each slave. By weight, grains and potatoes dominated the diet of both the free and slave population. Much has been made of the fact that corn was the principal grain consumed by slaves, while wheat was the principal grain in the free diet. Yet, from a nutritional standpoint, both are excellent foods, high in energy value, and with substantial protein content. Wheat is richer in calcium and iron, but corn has more vitamin A. What has completely escaped attention is the fact that both slaves and free men ate large quantities of potatoes. Slaves consumed virtually nothing but sweet potatoes, although most of the potatoes consumed by free men were white. The significance of this dichotomy is that sweet potatoes are a much better food than white potatoes. Sweet potatoes are especially rich in vitamins A and C, and are also fairly high in calcium. The high slave consumption of meat, sweet potatoes, and peas goes a long way toward explaining the astounding results shown in figure 34. The slave diet was not only adequate, it actually exceeded modern recommended daily levels of the chief nutrients. Footnote, that is the 1964 recommended daily levels of nutrition. End of footnote. On average, Slaves exceeded the daily recommended levels of protein by 110%, calcium by 20%, and iron by 230%. Surprisingly, despite the absence of citrus fruits, slaves consumed two and one-half times the recommended level of vitamin C. Indeed, because of the large consumption of sweet potatoes, their intake of vitamin A was at the therapeutic level, and vitamin C was almost at that level. Of course, the fact that the average daily nutrient content of the slave diet was good does not mean that it was good for all slaves, and even the best-fed slaves experienced seasonal variation in the quality of their diet due to the limitations in the technology of food preservation during the antebellum era. Data on slave housing are much more sparse than on slave diets. The most systematic housing information comes from the census of 1860, which included a count of slave houses. These census data show that on average, there were 5.2 slaves per house on large plantations. 
the number of persons per free household in 1860 was 5.3. Thus, like free men, most slaves lived in single-family households. The sharing of houses by several families of slaves was uncommon. Occasionally, on very large plantations, there were dormitories for unmarried men and women, but these were exceptional. The single-family household was the rule. Unfortunately, the census did not collect information on the size or quality of slave houses. Descriptions in plantation records and in travelers' accounts are fragmentary. They suggest a considerable range in the quality of housing. The best were three- or four-room cottages of wood frame, brick, or stone construction, with up to 800 square feet of space on the inside and large porches on the outside. Such cottages had brick or stone chimneys and glazed windows. At the other pole were single-room log cabins without windows. Chimneys were constructed of twigs and clay. Floors were either earthen or made of planks resting directly on the earth. Comments of observers suggest that the most typical slave houses of the late antebellum period were cabins about 18 by 20 feet. They usually had one or two rooms. Lofts, on which the children slept, were also quite common. Windows were not glazed, but closed by wooden shutters. Some houses had rear doors. Chimneys were usually constructed of brick or stone. The building material was usually logs or wood. Seams in the log cabins were sealed by wooden splints and mud. Floors were usually planked and raised off the ground. While such housing was quite mean by modern standards, the houses of slaves compared well with the housing of free workers in the antebellum era. It must be remembered that much of rural America still lived in log cabins in the 1850s, and urban workers lived in crowded, filthy tenements. One should not be misled by the relatively spacious accommodations in which U.S. working families live today. That is an achievement of very recent times. As late as 1893, a survey of the housing of workers in New York City revealed that the median number of square feet of sleeping space per person was just 35. In other words, the typical slave cabin of the late antebellum era probably contained more sleeping space per person than was available to most of New York City's workers half a century later. The best information on clothing comes from the records of large plantations. These indicate that a fairly standard annual issue for adult males was four shirts of cotton, four pairs of pants, two of cotton and two of wool, and one or two pairs of shoes. Adult women were issued four dresses per year, or the material needed to make four dresses. Hats were also typically issued annually. Women received handkerchiefs. Blankets were issued once every two or three years. There seems to have been much more variability in the issue of socks and underclothes. Issues of petticoats to women are mentioned in a few records, but not in most. Mention of socks and underwear for men is also irregular. For winter months, men had jackets, sometimes overcoats, although the frequency of their issue is unclear. Clothing for children showed some variation from a state to a state, but by far the most common issue was a one-piece garment, which looked like an extra-long shirt. Slave clothing was usually made of a coarse but durable cloth. The leather in slave shoes was of a high grade, but little attention was devoted to matters of fashion. Finer clothes were supplied to house servants and other favored slaves. Slaves also supplemented the standard issue by their own purchases. As indicated below, many slaves were able to earn substantial sums of money. Much of this was spent on such items of clothing as handkerchiefs and brightly colored cloth for dressmaking.